Hello guys, in this video I'm going to talk about a big O notation, what it is and why it is actually useful. The big O notation is in simple terms a way to measure and describe an algorithm's efficiency. Let's say we don't have something like the big O notation. How would we describe an algorithm's performance? One way to do that could be experimentally measuring the execution time of the program. We could write a program that implements the algorithm and which the time is clocked. But this is obviously not the most convenient way to measure time. By running the program with an input of different sizes and doing that in different situations, we can draw up a graph that shows this execution time as a function of that size. And the size of the input is represented by n. And we could then see how much time in milliseconds it takes to execute the program. Now this is not a good way to measure time for several reasons and one of them is that the tests are very limited and it's obvious that one computer is slower than another. So we need a way to compare the algorithms in a hardware independent way. And that's where Big O notation comes to the rescue. Big O notation is a mathematical language which allows us to talk about the time and the space complexity of an algorithm. It will compare an algorithm by looking at the number of steps it has to take in order to execute. This is what we call the time complexity of an algorithm. We also have space complexity which tells us how much memory is needed for the algorithm to run. It's very important to always assume the worst case scenario when comparing the algorithms. In addition to that we also have the best case scenario and also the average scenario. And the best way is to take the worst case scenario. I will tell you why with an example. Imagine a grocery store with only one cashier. The checkout process might look like this. The first step would be the customer puts an item on the conveyor belt. And this step will keep repeating itself until all grocery items are on the belt. Then the cashier will scan the item and she will put it in a bag. These two steps will keep repeating itself until all items are scanned and put in a bag. The cashier will tell the customer the total price and the customer will then pay for the items. In this situation, the best case scenario would be that the customer only wants to buy one item. The customer would put the item on the conveyor belt, which is one step. The cashier will scan the item and then put it in a bag. So now we have three steps. Then the cashier will tell the customer what the total price is that's four steps, and eventually the customer will pay. So now we have a total number of steps of five. Now imagine that the customer has 100 items instead of one. The customer would put 100 items on the conveyor belt, so the first step will be repeated 100 times. The cashier will scan the items and then put it in a bag. These two steps must be repeated 100 times bringing the total number of steps to 300. Then the cashier will tell the customer what the total price would be, and that's 301 steps, and eventually the customer will pay. So now we have a total number of steps of 302. Based on the best case scenario, you might think that the store is checking out the customers very efficiently, right? But what if? What if the customer wants to buy 100 products? And what if there are 10 more customers like that in line? It's clear that the store could never function efficiently in such a situation. And this is why you could only tell if an algorithm is efficient or not if you're measuring it in the worst case scenario. Having said that, the complexity will tell us how an algorithm will perform as the number of items it has to deal with grows. So as the number of items increase, the number of steps will increase. To put it in another way, it is how the algorithm will scale. And some of the algorithms scale very well, while others don't. The big O notation is written as a capital O, followed by an expression. And by convention, the number of input is written as N, which in our situation is the number of items the customer wants to buy. Okay, let's take our previous algorithm and find out how it will scale. So the first step is that the customer will put the items on the conveyor belt. So now we have to look at how many items we have. 
and we have n items so it will repeat n times so we now have n and then the cashier will scan the items and now we have 2 times n then she puts n items in the bag which gives us 3 times n and then the cashier will tell the customer the total price which doesn't depend on the input so we have 3 times n plus 1 and then the customer will pay which also doesn't uh, depend on the input so we get 3 times n plus 2 the 3 in 3 times n and the 2 don't change as the number of items grow in other words they remain constant so we can get rid of them as they don't determine the growth rate anyway so when writing the time complexity we only specify n because it's only n that influences the growth rate of the algorithm and because the complexity grows in a linear pattern we write on which stands for linear time complexity in addition to that we also have the constant time complexity which we write as O1. It's also the most efficient one, and it means that the time complexity doesn't change as the size of the input grows. Let's say you want to get the first element in an array, or you want to get a value in an array based on the index. In these cases, the time complexity will be always constant, no matter what. Then you have O log n, which is to the base two. It's the logarithmic time complexity, and just by looking at the graph, you can see that it grows very slowly. For now, it's okay if you don't understand where that comes from. It will become clear when you're going to learn about the search algorithms, in particular the binary search, which has a logarithmic time complexity. So that's the second most efficient time complexity. And then we have ON, which we have discussed already. And then you have the exponential time complexity. A good example for that is when you have a nested loop and that already indicates that you're doing something wrong. An algorithm which runs at this time complexity is not efficient. So you might want to consider a different solution to your problem. Once we will learn about the sort algorithms, you will see that the bubble sort algorithm, for example, has an exponential time complexity. You have to know them but uh, the sort method of Java, the arrays class, uses the quick sort algorithm, which is a much better algorithm and it has a time complexity of O n log n, which is far better than the exponential. This will sound very confusing at first, but it's because you haven't seen the algorithms yet. And once you know how they are implemented, then you will try to understand the time complexity of it.